Hi, this is a presentation prepared for the ISSET Mission Discovery Programme, which was hosted at King's College London in July this year, 2013. Um, Mission Discovery gives 14 to 18 year olds the opportunity to work with astronauts, astronaut trainers, rocket scientists, NASA leaders and physiologists to understand the effects of space, space travel and experimental design in space. Uh, this is a presentation um, for this programme which was presented uh, on the 16th of July 2013. The presentation is entitled The Circulatory System in Space and is designed as an outline um, to explain to 14 to 18 year olds the effect of microgravity in space on the circulatory system, the heart and the vasculature. Uh, my name is James Clark. I'm a physiologist at King's College London. So where to start when talking about uh, space and the effects of space on human physiology? Well, funnily enough, as is most of the case in research, the best place to start is to look at what happens on Earth. Um, it was about in the uh, 1600s that Sir Isaac Newton first looked at gravity and realized that um, gravity had an effect on the human body and certainly had an effect on objects in space and on Earth. And this knowledge of gravity has led to the understanding of how gravity affects physiology of humans. The big problem is, is understanding what the problem with going to space is. Um, if we understand how the human body behaves and the human body adapts to life on Earth, um, the problems with going to space are multiple. We don't just have the lack of gravity. We also have um, radiation risks. We have the vacuum of space. There's no oxygen, so you can't breathe. There are thermal considerations to worry about, um, as well as many other risks of um, depressurization, fire, poisoning, and other things that may happen in space. But we are focused today looking at the effects of space and microgravity, particularly on um, the human body. So let's just look at gravity and how the human body has adapted to gravity first. You can see on the screen um, some pictorial representations of the evolution of man. Uh, and two organs are shown here. In uh, green highlight is the brain and red highlight is the heart. And you can see that um, throughout evolution the brain and the heart have changed in the way they are um, related to each other. In early mammals, in quadrupeds, the heart and the brain are on a very similar level. So the effect of gravity on the movement of blood from the heart to the brain is certainly different to how it is now when we have evolved as bipeds, as upright mammals. And you can see on the far right hand side a representation of a human form where the brain is around 30 to 40 centimeters higher than the heart. The reason we have a circulatory system, it may sound a little bit crass, but the reason we have a circulatory system is to get blood to the brain. Admittedly, we need blood to our muscles to run, to exercise, to hunt, uh, to eat, and to reproduce. But we essentially, our cardiovascular system is adapted to provide the brain with enough oxygen. In order to do this, we have to have a series of pressure sensors or baroreceptors throughout our circulatory system to work out what the blood pressure is and therefore work out how much blood is reaching the brain. Of course there are other receptors in the body that sense blood volume, blood salinity, so the strength of the, or the weakness of the blood, how much water is in the blood, but essentially the baroreceptors are the controllers of blood pressure. The baroreceptors in a human uh, and most mammals are found in two places. They're found on the top of the aortic arch. This is the major vessel that leaves the heart and supplies the body um, with the systemic circulation. Um, and on the carotid sinus. So the carotid artery is the two arteries that travel from the aorta up to the brain. So you can see we have placed our baroreceptors conveniently in a place between the heart and the brain. And this is primarily because we want to monitor the blood pressure going to the brain and therefore keep the brain perfused well. So baroreceptors are mechanoreceptors. Um, they basically detect blood pressure and they do this by sensing the stretch in the wall of the blood vessel. Uh, blood vessels are fairly elastic and if blood pressure increases the uh, elastic walls stretch and if blood pressure decreases the elastic walls um, contract slightly and these baroreceptors pick this up and they provide feedback as part of a reflex feedback loop to control blood pressure. They are part of the FAST, the autonomic nervous system, 
uh, and they um, supply directly into the pressure sensors in the brain which then go straight back down to the controller of blood pressure which is the heart and either increase or decrease the cardiac output the stroke volume and the heart rate to increase or decrease blood pressure they control the blood pressure to the body and the brain independently as you can see we've got the carotid sinus and we've got the aortic arch sensors you can increase the uh, blood pressure in the brain by adapting the carotid sinus area and you can adapt the blood pressure to the rest of the body by sensing it at the aortic arch which is quite quite handy um, and it adopts a set point uh, if you imagine a thermostat in your home um, you set your thermostat to 18 degrees and your house maintains at 18 degrees um, if it's cold outside the heating comes on if it's warm inside the heating stays off um, the baroreceptors do a very similar job to blood pressure. Um, the brain wants a certain pressure around 75 to 80 millimeters of mercury pressure. And the units don't matter, just remember 75 to 80 units of pressure um, is what the brain requires. And obviously if your blood pressure increases uh, through uh, exercise or whatever, those uh, sensors will fire off and control the perfusion to the brain to make sure that set point is maintained. Um, an unfortunate part of aging is that your baroreceptor function tends to decrease and this is a combination of two things uh, potentially the baroreceptor cells themselves the cells within the membrane of the within the, the wall of the vessel may lose their sensitivity but equally the vessel itself becomes stiffer and therefore doesn't stretch quite as much when pressure changes so um, often you'll hear of uh, the elderly falling over when they stand up and that's simply because the pressure has changed in their head and they've, they've fallen faint and we're going to look at that a little bit later on in this presentation so the, the figures on the screen here you can see the heart beating at the top you can see some blood perfusing through capillaries and on the right hand side is uh, one of those plastinated humans um, which are fascinating to look at but these understanding of human physiology tells us that the cardiovascular system is perfectly adapted to living on earth um, so this is where the problem with space travel occurs we're used to living on earth we're used to having that gravity as a point of reference we're used to those baroreceptors responding to changes in blood pressure caused by gravity so when we leave Earth's gravitational field, we expose our bodies to a great degree of stress. Um, even before you reach the weightlessness of space, you have to um, accelerate to blast out of the Earth's atmosphere, out of the force of gravity to, to leave into space. And when you're doing this, um, you're exposed up to four times the Earth's gravity, so four times G, as we call it. Um, we can do this experimentally, so we can see in the lab what the acute or the short-term effects of exposure to this kind of gravity is. And we can do this in a centrifuge. Uh, you can see a picture of a centrifuge here, and that's me on the right there spinning away up at around 4G in the centrifuge. So the blood has been forced from my head down to my feet, just like being in a salad spinner. The water has been forced outwards. My blood has been forced down to my feet as I spin. And um, you have to control that, and your baroreceptors fire off and increase your heart rate and change the way your blood is perfusing. Um, you can do this yourself. You can go to a carnival or a, a theme park, amusement park. And there are roller coasters and various theme rides that will expose you to high gravitational forces, either in the vertical or the horizontal. Um, the problem with carnivals is it only happens for a few milliseconds or, or half a second at the most. We don't tend to... Um, it, pull high G while in a roller coaster for very long periods of time because that can be problematic as we'll, we'll find out. So we've got into space and we've now entered the world of, of microgravity. Um, remember that all celestial bodies have some form of gravity. Uh, the moon for instance has a gravity. It's only about 17% that of what's on earth. So if I was on the moon I would only weigh around 17% of my weight. So I'd weigh about 17 kilograms. Uh, this poses a problem because, of course, in space, where there is zero gravity, you don't weigh anything. Um, there is no point of reference. There's no up, there's no down, and there's certainly no gravity at all. We can experience this momentarily at least. Again, acute effects of microgravity we can see. Uh, these are students uh, at a NASA um, summer school, and they're experiencing zero gravity in a parabolic flight in an airplane. So the airplane does a parabolic flight, 
and during the uh, descent phase of the parabolic flight the bodies inside the aeroplane experience uh, near on zero gravity and you can see these students having a great deal of fun in zero gravity. Um, this is brilliant and it exposes us to uh, short periods of uh, microgravity or zero gravity which is very interesting for research but very hard to understand what might happen long term uh, in zero gravity. This is the first thing we see when uh, pilots go into space, when astronauts go into space. These are uh, photographs um, before on the left and after on the right when they enter um, microgravity. We call it puff face and bird leg syndrome and this is a classic problem associated with traveling in space. The face becomes puffy it seems to be engorged with blood, it seems to be quite red and puffy and the legs become quite thin, much thinner than they did half an hour before before they went into space. So this is puff face and Berg lead syndrome and you have to consider what might be happening here and we can demonstrate this quite quickly. It's the loss of hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of a column of water if you imagine you standing, you are a column of water. You've got blood in all your blood vessels traveling from your head down to your feet uh, and through your heart. And though that water weighs something, and the gravity on the Earth is pulling that water down towards your feet all the time. So we are, as I said, adapted to living on Earth. Therefore, we are adapted to the pull of gravity on that water. In space, there's no longer any gravity. Therefore, that blood is no longer being pulled towards your feet. So it's rather like standing on your head. You get a redistribution of the blood volume. It's no longer pooling in your legs and your head is all nice and happy and just getting the right amount of blood. The moment you enter microgravity or zero gravity, your heart continues to pump and now your head experiences a much higher blood pressure, much more blood than it did before you entered microgravity. And you can ask yourself this question, of course, why does my face turn red when I stand on my head? but why don't my feet turn red when I stand up? And that really explains the whole problem. We are adapted to living on land. There are very few people who can stand on their head without their faces going red because we are adapted to being upright from our feet up to our head. So this is what happens as we travel into space. This little pictorial here shows a human form with the head at the top, the feet at the bottom, and the heart in the middle and the red line down the center of the body indicates the blood pool, the blood volume. And you can see here there's a lot of blood around the torso, around the legs, um, and enough blood in the head to keep the blood perfused. And here are some numbers, 70, 100 and 200. 70 represents blood pressure in the brain, 100 represents blood pressure at the heart level, and 200 represents blood pressure at the feet. So you can see here that the blood pressure is distributed with the heart in the center and the brain receiving enough oxygen, enough blood at 70 millimeters of mercury pressure. So you travel then into zero gravity around space and you can see here the blood is then redistributed throughout your body fairly equally. So your head starts to receive more blood than it would have done while on Earth. This can cause a few problems. The effects of this fluid distribution can be acute, which is short term, and then can re redistribute to being a chronic problem, a long term problem. The short-term problem is pounding headaches. It's just like standing on your head for more than 10 minutes. You will get a pounding headache as more blood enters your brain and causes various receptors to get stretched and stressed. It can cause nausea because your brain is now engorged with fluid and your ears are engorged with fluid and it changes your perception and you become nausea and sick. And through the same mechanism, you become disorientated. This also affects the heart. The heart, as I said at the beginning, is a responder to changes in your pressure. So your baroreceptors fire off and essentially say to your brain, hey brain, my blood pressure's gone up. If my blood pressure has gone up, I need to lower my heart rate and I need to change my stroke volume, the amount of blood that I'm pumping on each beat, and reduce it so my brain is no longer being subjected to this high blood pressure. So this is what happens within the first minutes to hours of being in space, your head is pounding, you've got nausea, disorientation, and your heart slows a little bit and your stroke volume decreases a little bit. So your cardiac output, which is the amount of blood you pump in a minute, decreases to try and decrease your blood pressure and normalize your blood pressure to the set point that your baroreceptors were programmed to while on Earth. 
We can do this in the laboratory to some extent. Again, we've got our pictorial here of our head, heart and legs showing the representative pressures that we'd expect to see in a normal human standing. Um, rather than standing people on their head, which can be incredibly uncomfortable and actually pulls a lot more blood towards the head than we'd actually want, we can lean people back about six degrees on a bed. So essentially you lie down and then you just lift your legs up while lying flat to about six degree tilt. And in fact the fluid distribution across the entire body is representative of the fluid distribution you get in space. It's not identical. Of course you still have the pressure of the atmosphere on your chest. You still have the effect of gravity now on your hydrostatic gradient from chest to back, but you do get a fluid shift towards the head. We see facial puffing, headache, nasal congestion, the same problems we see um, in space, and you also get the other problems we'll talk about very shortly. We use this experimentally. We can uh, put students or, or researchers on a tilt table for short periods of time and do various tests on them to see how their pressure responds and how their body responds. But as you can see in the figure on the bottom right, we can also leave people in a head down tilt bed for many, many weeks on end and try and work out what the chronic effects of this might be and see if we can model the effects of being in space um, in the laboratory. So you've been in space for a little while, um, you've exposed yourself to microgravity and your head has started pounding and your blood pressure's dropped. What ends up is you end up being adapted to living in space. So after a few weeks to a month of being in space, your blood pressure has now dropped from being 100 mean arterial pressure when you left Earth to around 75, 60, 75 millimeters of mercury once you're in space for a while. Um, your brain has now been perfused at the right level, so about 75 millimeters of mercury pressure. And because you are now in microgravity or zero gravity and there is no gravitational reference, your body now is all receiving a very similar blood pressure unlike when you're on Earth and unlike the initiation of heading into space. So you've no longer got headaches, you've no longer got problems with nausea and you are um, happy in many ways in space. The, the, the long-term effects are different certainly to the short-term effects. We've seen that humans can exist in weightlessness for around one to one and a half years. There doesn't seem to be big problems in living in space for this amount of time. However, your physical capability when you return to Earth is seriously reduced. Um, there are changes to your musculoskeletal physiology, your, your skeletal muscle is wasting away because it's not being used. Your bones, especially the long bones and the weight-bearing bones that aren't being used, also tend to lose their strength. So although you can probably survive in space for quite a long time, the return to Earth could well be um, quite dangerous. So we call this cardiovascular deconditioning. We, we describe deconditioning as essentially becoming unfit. So disuse atrophy, as we call it, is when the heart starts to lose mass. Just like your muscles, if you don't use them, you lose your muscles. You have to go to the gym or exercise regularly to maintain your muscle mass. If you don't use your heart as much, and as we saw in the previous figure, the heart isn't generating as much force as it did before, it's not generating as much pressure, therefore it's not working quite so hard, it tends to uh, start to reduce in size. So you can lose up to 12% of your left ventricular mass over two to nine weeks in space, and this continues to drop over a longer period, up to about 20% to 25% of your cardiac mass can be lost. And of course, the more heart muscle you lose, the more heart function you lose, not necessarily while sleeping or just sitting around, but if you try and exercise, you'll really realize that your heart isn't very fit and has very little reserve. Of course, there are changes in heart rate. We talked about that earlier. And there, of course, are changes in the ability of the heart to use oxygen. If it's not working as hard, it doesn't need to use as much oxygen. And so some of the metabolic processes in the heart start to shut down because they don't need to use them. Therefore, they don't need to use all that energy. Also, the health of your blood vessels decreases. Um, we know about a condition called atherosclerosis on land, where the uh, vessels become calcified and quite uh, thickened. And we spoke earlier about what happens to the elderly when they um, reach 
ages that uh, they are susceptible to atherosclerosis and, and thickening and hardening of arteries. Well, you lose the elasticity of your arteries while in space as well. Um, so it's potentially quite dangerous. Your blood pressure control, which relies on your um, elastic arteries, can be lost as well. Unfortunately, well, fortunately you could say that, but also quite unfortunately, you have some very complex feedback mechanisms in your body. Um, I mentioned before that the baroreceptors are the principal controller of blood pressure. Well, the kidneys are the long-term controller of blood pressure. Um, when you wee, you are getting rid of excess water. So the more you drink, the more you wee. Um, you can become dehydrated if you wee without drinking. So essentially your kidneys control how much water is in your body. If you lose water from your body, you're also losing water from your blood. And if you lose water from your blood, of course, you will become um, dehydrated and your blood will become thicker. So let's just look at the blood as one example of one of these feedback mechanisms, uh, although there are many we could consider. Of course, feedback from the baroreceptors and the kidneys tell our brain and tell our body that we have too much blood. The blood pressure being too high means that we have too much. So what happens is the kidneys start to excrete more blood, uh, more water. And I can give you an example of this. If anyone has ever been swimming for more than about 30 or 40 minutes, so just paddling around in a swimming pool, or anybody who's been scuba diving will know that if they're in the water for more than about 35, 45 minutes, you will probably need to go for a pee. And this is why many swimming pools um, end up with lots of pee in them, um, because children in the swimming pool uh, need to go for a wee after about 40 minutes, and therefore just go for a wee after about 40 minutes. Um, adults tend to hold back a bit, but it's a very common problem, and it's perfectly normal, it's perfectly physiological. And I'll explain how and why that works. Essentially, when you see a high blood pressure, when your kidneys think there's a high blood pressure, they produce urine. Let's now imagine you're stood waist deep or, or neck deep in a swimming pool. The water is compressing your legs because the water has a weight much more than air. So your legs are being squashed by that water pressure. The water pressure squashing your legs is forcing more blood back up to your heart. Your heart then is pumping bigger volumes of blood and your baroreceptors are sensing a higher pressure. If your baroreceptors sense a higher pressure, they tell the body to excrete more water and to lower blood pressure. Therefore, your kidneys work a little bit harder and produce a little bit more urine, and therefore your bladder fills quicker than it would do if you were sat on a chair by the side of the pool. And the same for scuba divers. They're totally immersed in the water, and the pressure of the water on their bodies gives an indication to their baroreceptors that they have a higher than normal blood pressure and therefore they excrete a lot of that water. Fairly simple to explain, so next time you'll be in the pool you have an excuse, it's because your body made you do it. So there you are. Blood volume will decrease of course throughout the urine um, and the number of red blood cells will decrease by about 15% after three months because what happens is because your blood now has lost a fair bit of water there are more cells in your blood per unit volume than there were before you lost the water. If you have a finite number of cells in your blood and you suddenly lose half of the water content of your blood, there's going to be more cells in your blood uh, compared to there were before. And your body senses this and it goes, well, hang on, I don't need that many red blood cells. I don't need that many blood cells. I'm going to decrease their production. So after about three months, you lose about 15% of your red blood cells. Um, that's called space anemia. Anemia being the term saying lack of red blood cells. Of course, your red blood cells are needed to transport oxygen around your body. Um, you can survive with slightly less than normal red blood cells. That's not a problem. But your red blood cells are needed when you're exerting yourself, when you're working hard, exercising hard. You need that little bit extra red blood cells to carry oxygen to the muscles that are working. So remember that in a minute. We may need to think about that again. Of course, when you combine the red blood cells with the loss of liquid, the plasma that we've excreted, your blood volume could decrease by 10 to 12 percent. So instead of having five liters of blood volume in an adult, you'll end up with about four and a half liters, just under four and a half liters of blood volume. So essentially you become dehydrated. Interestingly enough, the activity of the lymphocytes, the bacteria fighting white blood cells, is also slightly reduced, meaning that in theory, at least uh, astronauts after a few months could be susceptible to infection more than uh, perhaps being on land, um, although 
the environment in space is kept very clean, therefore the likelihood of a pathogen existing in a space station or wherever is, is very small. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, upon returning to Earth, it doesn't take very long, only a few weeks, where your red blood cell count and blood volume all return to normal, uh, which is good. And we'll talk about returning to Earth uh, in a few seconds. So what are the consequences of this cardiovascular deconditioning? Um, well, the consequences for being in space over a few days doesn't seem to be that problematic. Uh, if you're traveling to the ISS, the space station, dropping off some equipment, doing a couple of spacewalks and heading home, you know, those few days aren't going to cause you huge amounts of physiological stress. The problem is when you've been up there for a while and you're expected to then perform. With this deconditioning, the drop in heart rate, the drop in blood pressure, and the decrease in red blood cells and blood volume, your body is unable to maintain high or moderate intensity activity. So going out on a spacewalk and EVA would be very tough for somebody who's been in space for a few weeks. And you'll find if you look at the way that um, EVA, spacewalks and other maintenance jobs are done in space, you'll see that they're normally done by the fresh astronauts who've just come up, not by the astronauts that have been there for a while. Of course, if the astronaut is unable to react quickly and effectively during a crisis, so if they're expected to manhandle equipment around which could be quite heavy or do exercise, it may increase the risk of injury. Uh, and with only six crew on board, we have to be very careful that uh, members of the team on the ISS aren't exposed to an increased risk of injury. That's, uh, that's bad news for them. So we've got to consider that when we're sending people into space. So they've been in space for a while, uh, they've deconditioned, their blood pressure is now lower, their baroreceptor set point has been changed, and they're slightly anemic. Uh, we then expect them to return back to Earth. And uh, for the purposes of this presentation, let's just ignore the fact that their bodies are exposed to another 6 to 8 G on return to Earth, and let's just pretend they've reached Earth safe and sound without any problems on re-entry. So we've, we've deconditioned and we have adapted to living in space. And this is the position we were in when we left it earlier. Our, our little body here has a, a mean pressure of 75 millimeters of mercury throughout. And we return back down to our 1G environment. Yes, now we've got the problem in that our body has now been re-exposed to this hydrostatic pressure gradient that's induced on Earth. So this column of water in the body has now been forced back down to the feet. Because you have vascular and cardiovascular and cardiac deconditioning, all the blood basically starts falling towards your feet. Um, your vasodilating and your blood vessels are opened up and the blood just goes flomp down towards the feet so you lose blood pressure in the brain and the schematic here shows this quite clearly um, the blood pool is now down towards the feet and zero blood pressure in the brain means that you'll pretty quickly fall over um, this has a name associated with it it's called orthostatic tolerance or in the fact we're talking about it now is orthostatic intolerance you are unable to maintain an upright posture. Um, the, the definition in Webster's is the ability to resist the effects related to or caused by the erect posture. In other words, orthostatic tolerance is the ability to stand up. And you'll notice in pictures of astronauts, cosmonauts returning from space after short or long-term flights, they normally sit down. Um, I love the picture at the bottom here. This is of some Chinese astronauts recently returning they're happily sitting on their garden chairs, having just emerged from their capsule, and they're happily waving at the press photographers. They are doing this for a reason. They aren't doing it because it's nice to have a little sit down after such a long journey. They're doing it because they're actually physically incapable of standing up. If they were to stand up, they would probably pass out. Um, and that's that's been in space for maybe two months, three months. Um, so that's quite a disturbing thing. We all um, associate deconditioning with long-term problems. We, we associate it with being in space for a long time. It can happen in a very short time. Uh, Heidi Marie Piper here was in space for just 12 days. Um, she returned to America. She was giving a speech about how great space was and within about three or four minutes of standing up there she went a bit pale, felt faint and then fell over. So 12 days in zero gravity had deconditioned her cardiovascular system to such an extent that she couldn't maintain a standing position. Her blood pressure dropped too quickly. So how can we protect these astronauts? How can we stop them having these problems? Well, we can learn a lot from nature. If you think about snakes, snakes can dangle from trees and catch prey without passing out. They can 
go and climb up trees without passing out. They can go horizontally, vertically, they can go in water, they can come out of water, and you don't tend to see uh, a snake passing out when it's exerting itself. Um, so snakes are quite interesting. Unfortunately, snakes are not mammals, therefore they have a very different circulatory system, and that's why they're snakes. And in fact, they have baroreceptors, pressure sensors, in their tails, so they know what their blood pressure is, and they can respond to different uh, positions, which is quite handy. Bats, they are mammals, and of course, they hang upside down for 18 hours a day. During the daytime, they sleep in caves, and it's not often that you'll see a bat leaving a cave and then passing out because it can't handle the, the stress and strain of uh, changes in gravity. Um, bats do have a slightly different cardiovascular system to us and they have adapted to hanging upside down. You don't see bats with headaches. They don't tend to dangle upside down and get headaches. Um, so they've got a slightly different cerebral circulatory system than humans and they've adapted quite nicely to that. And then of course there's giraffes. Giraffes are fascinating creatures. They have incredibly long necks and yet they are able to swing their heads down to drink and then put their heads up in the air without falling over or feeling faint. So we can learn a lot actually from a, an animal like a giraffe. So here's a pictorial of a, of a giraffe and here's some blood pressures just uh, over the top. The brain of course, 75 millimeters of blood pressure, it likes that. Um, it's a good perfusion pressure for brain. The heart at 100 millimeters of mercury and the feet at 400 millimeters of mercury. Of course, the feet are a lot further away from the heart than they are in humans. Therefore, there's much more hydrostatic pressure. But you'll see, despite the fact the head is a good 10, 15 feet up from the heart, the blood pressure in the brain is still the same as it is in a human without the need of increasing the blood pressure leaving the heart. So how have these giraffes adapted to this kind of... Um, length of neck. Well, they have tougher, tighter skin. They are essentially very, very tight skinned. You don't tend to see giraffes with wrinkles on them. And that's because their skin is incredibly thick, it's incredibly elastic and very, very tight. And the reason it needs to be tight is it needs to squash the tissue beneath it to stop the build-up of edema, to stop swelling, to stop blood and fluid leaving the blood vessels because of this large hydrostatic gradient. They have thicker, smooth muscle. The muscle that surrounds each of the blood vessels is thicker, more dynamic, and it can squeeze a little bit better than the smooth muscle in human vessels. Therefore, it can maintain a good flow of blood up to the brain. And the great thing about giraffes is they actually have reinforced leg arteries. The arteries that take blood down to their feet have a much thicker membrane around the outside of them that essentially is a waterproof membrane like a garden hose so they're not leaky at all and they're not very flexible so they're basically like having a drain pipe down the leg it helps transport blood to and from the feet much more efficiently so essentially a giraffe is a walking anti-gravity suit and we can learn a lot from giraffes um, in human physiology in fact elderly people who might have swollen ankles due to heart failure or, or problems with their um, blood pressure control we often put pressure garments on people. These are a little picture here of pressure so um, stockings where they very tight pressure towards the feet and that pressure slowly slacks off as you come up the leg. And this helps push fluid back up to the body again. And this helps maintain um, cardiac output and help to maintain blood pressure and stop swelling of the feet. So essentially, although we didn't learn this from giraffes, we've learnt it from the observations from giraffes and you can see that a, a, a pressure socking is very similar to that of a, of a giraffe leg. Um, we can use countermeasures while in space to try and uh, help our astronauts remain fit and healthy. Um, but to be honest, the simplest thing to do with an astronaut to maintain fitness is to make sure they're fit before they go up. Uh, most astronauts go through a rigorous training program to maintain cardiovascular fitness before they travel up. And of course, the fitter they are before they go, um, the little, the least they'll decondition while up there. They'll still decondition the same amount, but if they've got more muscle mass and more fitness to start with, they will uh, come back in a, in a slightly better position than they would do if they were unfit before they went. So there's a rigorous training um, regime before astronauts go into space. And while they're in space, they're also forced to exercise. You can see on the right here this figure of an astronaut looking a little bit grumpy. Um, he's going for a run on a treadmill. Um, it's not like a normal treadmill. Um, it does have a rotating um, mat down the bottom. But the astronaut himself is uh, wearing a harness. You can see over his shoulders. And some bungee cord is pulling him downwards towards the treadmill. So the bungee and the, and the cabling attached to his harness is forcing him onto the treadmill and therefore forcing him to run using his muscles. Of course in space 
you can run as much as you like and be floating so it's quite important that you actually make good solid contact with the floor while you're running so this is something that astronauts do every day um, most uh, crew on the ISS the space station are doing up to if not more two hours of cardiovascular workout isometric muscle exercise weight lifting running all sorts of things on the space station to try and maintain cardiovascular fitness so we also have various countermeasures to try and maintain orthostatic tolerance um, here's a pictorial in the middle here of our little body again and what uh, the Russians have developed and we're now developing in um, ESA and NASA in, the, in the Europe and America is we're trying to develop lower body negative pressure suits so in the last few days or weeks before you return to Earth they can put you inside this uh, suit um, you can see here it's clamped around the waist and the lower legs essentially have a vacuum sucked out of them so they are kind of a vacuum container and this forces blood down to the feet because if there's a lower pressure surrounding your feet it forces blood down to them much the same as the opposite way around from when you're in the pool when you've got a higher pressure around your feet it forces blood out of your feet so this sucks blood into your legs and simulates the experience you're going to have when you head back down to earth and experience 1G again so you can do this to people in space uh, on the left is uh, an astronaut uh, trying out this uh, technology in the space station and on the right is a subject trying out this technology in a uh, parabolic flight to see how it works uh, and this is quite effective at trying to reset the baroreceptor set point so the baroreceptors have reset themselves to a lower blood pressure and by forcing them to experience a few drops in blood pressure by lower body pressure you can enforce the baroreceptors to uh, reset their set point which is an ingenious idea and works quite effectively of course the future holds some very strange things uh, not least is uh, space tourism um, there's an opportunity for us all to pay money and go into space very soon um, who will the first space tourist be? Well, they're liable to be very rich people because at the moment 200 and something thousand pounds to go into space is not uh, affordable for most people. Unfortunately, uh, it's just a fact of life that most of the people that can afford 200 and something thousand pounds to travel are not going to be in the peak physical condition of our astronauts. Um, people who are overweight, unfit, have diabetes, most likely have cardiovascular risks they have cardiovascular disease and are very likely um, to have heart problems and blood pressure control problems maybe not the best population to be sending into space when we've just heard the problems associated with blood pressure in space um, they don't do much exercise uh, people with lots of money and of a large body mass don't tend to be running on treadmills and becoming very fit and there is a very high likelihood that we will be requiring a few of these uh, on some of the space flights so we need to be very careful about monitoring health of astronauts uh, or space tourism uh, when they start to blast off in the few years to come so this is going to be uh, interesting press I think in the next few years of course the future everyone is telling us is colonization of other planets and Mars is the first contender for this it's very likely in the next 10 to 15 years we'll be flying to landing on and eventually colonizing or at least trying to colonize uh, Mars, um, you know, pretty pictures, very nice to see what they're thinking of doing of course the, the proof will be in the pudding when we finally go there so um, Mars does have a gravity, Mars has a gravity of around 30% of that of Earth or 40% of that of Earth so you will not have all the same problems on Mars as you would do oh, I'm going to microgravity but of course the journey to Mars could be a year and a half to getting there uh, if it takes that long to get there just imagine what physical condition you might be in by the time you get there um, so although you may not be able to handle the 1G on Earth you may not be able to handle the 0.5G or 0.6G whatever it is on Mars when you get there so this is also a concern uh, trying to improve cardiovascular fitness of people if they are traveling to Mars of course you can get a free flight to Mars these days um, there are companies that are advertising one-way tickets to Mars um, it's a long journey as I said about a year and a half it will take you to get there and there are companies Mars One is one of these companies you can send an application form in and you can put your name down to be the first person uh, to travel in a spaceship to Mars um, you may never make there uh, you may perish on the way and of course it's a one-way ticket so they're not going to pick you up and bring you home so it's an interesting proposal um, when you poll people in auditoriums 
you tend to find around 15% to 20% of people would actually volunteer to do this. Um, it is obviously a once in a lifetime experience, um, however it will be the last thing you do. And who knows what's coming next. Um, the Mars One flights will all be televised. The participants on Mars One will be carrying cameras, clipped on cameras and telemetry equipment that will be sending back all their details um, from the moment they leave Earth till the moment that they perish on the way to or and on Mars. So uh, watch this space and we'll see what happens next. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for paying attention and listening to all of this. It's just an introduction to cardiovascular physiology in space and I hope you enjoyed it.